1989. Amid the glitz and the glitter of a bustling young Disney world at the height of its golden age, the Disney MGM Studios was a star in its own right, a beacon for the show business elite. Then, something happened that changed all that. The time is now to celebrate 35 years of Disney's Hollywood Studios with the largest ever in-person gathering of those who created its magic. The Imagineers who brought you the great movie ride. Muppet Vision 3D. And of course, as you may recognize, the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. We'll present never before seen stories and artwork from the Hollywood that never was but always will be. This event is somewhat unique in that it will offer a meet and greet and autograph session as well as two days of star-studded panels and presentations. We invite you, if you dare, to register at stage89.com to attend this event either in person or via streaming or just to get more information. And all event proceeds travel directly to Give Kids the World Village. Welcome to the WDW News Today podcast. My name is Eric Morton, and with me, as always, is Tom Corliss. Tom, it's good to see you. I did my Hall of Presidents nod as if I'd been I like introduced. That. Yeah. Buddy Knox. <laughs> you ever seen that video? The um, the inaccurate Hall of Presidents? No. They're all just made-up names. They do the whole roll call, and it's just made up. We'll watch it after. Who did this? It's a, I, it's from like 10 years ago. It's uh, amazing. And one of them's Buddy Knox. Buddy Knox. <laughs> That's like uh, Key and Peele doing the football player in it, And it was before that. Yeah. It, it predates that. <laughs> Buddy Knox. So it feels like it was the inspiration for that. But President Buddy Knox. I've, Buddy Knox. Is that the guy on the on the uh, uh, APM from MCO when you land? Hi, I'm Orlando Mayor. Oh, That's Buddy, Buddy Dyer. Buddy Dyer. Buddy Knox. I don't like Buddy Dyer because he replaced Jack Wagner. Yeah. For those that don't know, Disney legend Jack Wagner used to be the voice of the MCO, uh, monorail, tram, APM, whatever you want to call it. We are your number one source for inner airport transportation yeah. news. Between we had the, the, the people, mover. people mover. Yeah, um, yeah, they renamed the APM to Gatelink. What a what a terrible process that has been. They that was supposed to be done several years ago already. Yeah. And they're still running some of the old ones. Like, look, I'm happy they're still running the old ones because I love them. Um, so it, it's always a treat when I get to get on one of the old ones and still and the, and the Delta terminal still uses the old ones, so I get to do that a lot. I think when you fly out of Tampa, it's kind of like maybe what you feel when you go from Disney World to like Tokyo. Where you're like, oh, this is so much better. They got the idea from here, but they made it so much better. That's what the Tampa airport is like compared to the Orlando airport. But there's one major problem with the Tampa airport. That it's in Tampa? It requires you to go to Tampa. Yeah, you have to drive an hour and a half to get there. But it is a much nicer airport with a very similar concept. I think maybe even the same architectural team. Maybe. Um, So maybe they took all the lessons they learned. I don't know. Mm. You can tell us in the comments. Okay. I'm just a – I don't know. I was – a lot of airports recently. Yeah. That's a topic I am not an expert Kansas on. Kansas City has the new one. You've been to the new one. It was nice. Yeah, uh, yeah it went, very yeah, nice. I've been there, unfortunately, too much recently. But on my way back, you know, I was up there. I was there for the the Super Bowl mm-hmm. and the Super Bowl parade. Yeah. Um, which unfortunately which ended usually with, would be a happy thing. To talk yeah, which about, is supposed yeah. to be a happy time and ended, ended yeah. with uh, uh, tragedy. Um, but uh, it, was, are, it was it was a good place to be for a while. It was yeah. fun. And uh, then, uh, of course, we had service for Andy uh, on last Saturday. And then uh, Jason Diffendahl rode home with me. My car had been up there for a few weeks. How long were the two of you in the car? Like a couple days. I don't know. We left on Monday morning. uh, And I did not take the the fastest route. Hmm. Route. 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 Whatever you call it. It's fine. Uh, Route or route. I didn't take the fastest way because we decided we're going to stop at the Buffalo Trace Distillery on the way back and get their bourbon drop on the the Tuesday morning, which we did. It was 
E.H. Taylor. We have there's like a website you can see like people go okay today they had Weller which means tomorrow there's a 55 percent chance it's going to be Blanton's. There's a 30 percent chance it's going to be E.H. Whatever. Yeah. So we did that and so um, was that what you were hoping for? You wanted Blanton's? Yeah, E.H. Taylor or Blanton's were fine or Eagle, okay. Eagle Rare anything but Weller because I I can find Weller uh, around. Yeah. Um, but so the first day, our drive was only like a little over eight or nine hours, maybe eight or nine hours. Mm. But the second day, that one was like 12 and a half, 13 hours. Yeah. You know, it wasn't nearly as fun. But it was good. I, I drove the whole time. I didn't make Jason do any driving. He was working. He had his laptop out. He was, you know, doing uh, stuff with the webs- with our website yeah. and making sure people got paid and all that kind of stuff. That's good um, that people got so, paid. That's yeah. Good. So, you know, these holiday weeks are weird. So. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I'm back and uh, I'm ready to do the podcast thing. Uh, shout out to the Wigs who are watching live. That is a Wigs benefit at the seven dollars and up uh, level. You can uh, watch us do this live. They're here in Discord, telling us things, asking us things, and uh, they get to see the whole thing a few days early because this usually we record on Fridays and mm-hmm. comes out on Tuesdays. If you want to learn more about becoming a Wigs member, you can go to wdwnt.com/slash Patreon or Patreon.com/slash. W-D-W-N-T, and um, you can learn about all the benefits at all the different levels. Obviously, a big thing that's coming up for us, Stage 89. Yeah. Maybe the biggest thing we've ever done. I think so. First, I want to apologize for the... um, You might occasionally hear some noise outside. They're repairing the sign on the front of our building. So right now, a cherry picker is retracting. I don't know if that's audible or not, but I just want to mention it, because if not, I know someone will go in the comments and... Say, ah, our noise. <laughs> well, on on one side there, you have some noise, but on the other, they're making it nicer. Just they in are. time for we're, stage eighty nine. It's being refurbished for your future enjoyment. We'll right. be we'll be doing a lot of refurbishment up in the front of this office soon. So, in the not too distant future, you'll see uh, we won't be in this space anymore for the podcast. We'll be in a dedicated space, our own yeah. spot. We don't have to share it with Joe Labelle and all these people that come in here every week. <laughs> Mention Joe. No offense, Joe. I love you, but um, this is kind of your space. Yeah, I feel like we're intruding. We have to set it up and take it down, and set it up and take it down, and uh, so we'll have a permanent home for our podcast studio. Yeah, that'll that'll be nice. But uh, Stage Eighty Nine is kind of our theme today. You you saw the commercial at the beginning of this show. Hopefully, uh, that commercial had the voiceover for that commercial is done by Mark Silverman. Uh, Mark is the voice of Rod Serling on the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. Now he's coming to our event and was gracious enough to do the voiceover for our commercial. Can we call him Serling Silverman? Is that too corny? I'm sure you could. Okay. Serling. Wow. You know... That's why I'm always going to be someone. I forget years ago on the pod on our old podcast, someone thought it was Rod Sterling, and I was like, it's not. It's Rod Serling. Um who goes to the Twilight Zone. But Mark was nice enough to do that. I think it's a tremendous commercial, and uh, um, I think it sets a tone for what's going to be a really cool event, which for those of you who don't know, again, it's the largest ever in-person gathering of the people who made the Disney MGM Studios um, and pretty much every attraction. We have eight panels planned. I don't think these are announced even at this point, but I'll... Uh, if I give a quick rundown, I might as well. You have a lot of people coming, a lot of important people. Yeah, and coming. every panel is like, we've never had this before. Every panel has like three to five people on it. So we have yeah. multiple people for every project, which is super cool. Sometimes we get like one person from a project. This this never happens, right? The, the lightning in the bottle uh, events for us were the Illuminations event where we had the entire team that yeah. worked on that. And this is that lightning in the bottle again where this will never happen ever again. Um, so we're doing, there's going to be um, Randy Prince, who was pretty much second in command on the project to Bob Weiss, who, who was creatively in charge of the park. park. Randy was kind of the, the, the other side of the brain, right? Randy was operations right. and making the park function, right? Is so it like us? Yeah. Like, okay. I think that people have equated like Jason and I, right? Like Jason's more of the, not that he does a great job. <laughs> Look, I love Jason. Jason's an important part of the company. I don't know that finance is Jason's strong suit either. Um, right. But one, like I, there's I, nobody here who says you, you know what my I, strong suit is finance. Yeah, you and I are probably more the creative side, and Jason's more of the like, how do we actually keep make us it in happen? line? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so Randy Prince was that side, but um, Randy really wants to do a presentation essentially about the evolution of the park from from like when they first sat down and it was just a studio tour to what it became and then to eventually like the deterioration of the studio and it becoming just sort of a regular theme park. Sort of our keynote opening presentation would be um, the evolution of the park from start to finish from someone that was there through right. it all. Um, and then beyond that, there'd be a presentation with the team from Great Movie Ride. Um, there'll be one for Superstar Television and the Monster Sound Show, which yeah. I know some of our younger fans may not be familiar, oh, but I know those of us of an older age group are very excited about that. The Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Spectacular. We have several people that worked on that. Um, specifically, Catastrophe Canyon and some of the other effects of the Backlot Tour, the Herbie that used to drive out and yeah. beat your car. Um, and then also, um, that presentation will also include the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids movie playset adventure, which oh was boy. the playground, which I know I have a particular amount of nostalgia for, and I'm sure other people do too. Uh, we have, obviously, Tower of Terror. We're celebrating 30 years of Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. So we have uh, pretty much anyone who uh, was anything on that project. Uh, then we have Muppet Vision 3D and the Muppet Land that wasn't built, including the great Muppet movie ride. And last but not least, to see if I can remember what I'm missing. Oh, Star Tours. Uh, so oh, we yeah. have folks that worked on Star Tours 1 and Star Tours 2. Okay. So we'll bring you how the original for MGM was brought to life and then the evolution into Star Tours 2. And I don't think you get higher on the food chain than um, I think Eric Robbins, uh, not Eric Robbins, Eric Jacobson, excuse me, um, was pretty much in charge of Star Tours The Adventures Continue. So I think he worked pretty directly with George Lucas in that project. I know I've heard some stories from him before that are pretty entertaining and um i'm sure but but everyone's gonna bring never before seen art you're gonna hear stories that maybe uh maybe they can't tell at a disney event yeah um so i think it's it's gonna be just an incredible incredible once in a lifetime thing where you can join us either in person which is the best way because you obviously miss things if you're home but if you really can't make it we have a streaming ticket which is still 50 percent off through march 15th again all available at stage89.com now, Tom, I can't help but notice that your shirt does not match my shirt today. No, but they're both Park Candy. They're both from Park Candy. You can find out more at parkcandy.com and use the code WDWNT. Well, no, they got to use that link. You don't have to use that because if you use the WDWNT at checkout, you get 15% off. Oh, that works the same? Okay. I think so. But, yeah, if you want to try it this way, go to WDWNT. Or just scan the link. QR code if you're watching the video version. And, yeah, there is a video version of this. WDWNT.link slash Park Candy. Either way, all these tremendous – I've never seen this one you have. And the it's Tiki fantastic. Birds? I love it. They're so – they're pudgy and fat and cute. I love them. No comment. And there's the on anybody bird. who's pudgy there's and the, fat and cute on this show. Here come the girls. Yeah. I'm pudgy <laughs> and fat. It's is that Michael? Fine. And then there's the rest of the gang, yeah, but then also the girls made it. Oh, yeah. It's cute. Very nice. I love it. Uh, these shirts are great. They're comfortable. Um, and, yeah, if you uh, use the code WWNT, then you get 15% off, and it helps us out and helps a sponsor. There you go. So go to Park Candy and check it out. So I'm, I'm of the age. I had just moved to Florida in 1989. I was yeah. of the right age that I could go to Disney by myself. Kind of, I had some independence, right? Yeah. Um, and I... Superstar Television and and uh, Monster Sound Show, man. That I finally I got to be on Superstar Television. I probably went to it like twice, but you know, hoping to be on it. And then my dad and I were both on Superstar Television. I was yeah. he was a guest on Johnny Carson uh, on a Tonight Show. Yeah, and I was asking a question of Dave Letterman. Mm. And so remember, I had to say, "Hey, Dave, how come you never do anything educational?" And then like. Threw a bunch of crap off of a roof and all that fun stuff. Those were the days, man. Yeah, these are this was good stuff. So um, Diz, I'm Diz excited. Daisy for this. in in the Wigs chat, mm -hmm. uh, it is said. Quote: Those of us that are older, Tom was one when MGM opened. I was not. I was nine in, months old. infant. I was nine months old. Wow. When MGM opened, so. Um, but I was alive for all the early stuff. Like I remember, none of that was erased yet. Um, so at least I got to see all of original MGM. I saw Superstar Television. I saw Monster Sound Show. Yeah. Yeah. Do you consider Indiana Jones original, since it wasn't open on opening day, 
it was a few months, right? Like August. They uh, were in ish. previews when okay. the park opened. They were supposed yeah. to open May and they didn't. The the reoccurring theme you're going to hear through the event, which I think is amazing, is that they were under the most incredible time crunch, right? They were racing against Universal. Not that anyone wants to admit that, um, but they were racing against Universal and there was only so much time to hit May 1st, 1989, right? So with uh, Richard Vaughn in the case of, of uh, Catastrophe Canyon, you're going to hear how they did that. I think it was 11 to 13 months from initial concept to completion, which wow. is is insane, insane. And Indiana Jones is going to be a lot of the same where um, Philip Vaughn, who's not related to Richard, um, but Philip Vaughn, who, who worked on, uh, was in charge of Indiana Jones, um, was telling me, number one, it started as a Cleopatra stunt show. With, okay. with boats. So it was on like water. Okay. Uh, and then very quickly, George Lucas got on board and they changed it to Indiana Jones and they built it. It was meant to be uh, there for three years. They built it to last three years. Um, wow. But they only had a little amount of time to pull it off. And so by August of 89, it was fully ready to roll. Um, but people did see previews before August of 89. So it, it, it's kind of an opening day attraction, kind of not. It's yeah. pretty wild that this attraction was only designed to last a short time. And it's the only and thing left. It's the only thing left. And, you know, I think the most interesting part of that is that that's a lot of valuable real estate that they could have done yeah. other things with. Yeah. So um, I, love, I love the show, yeah. but I'm surprised that it has survived this long. Yeah. Be- not because it's not good and not because people don't like it, but because it takes up an awful lot of real estate. I think it, and, it's, it's one of those things where... Um, Victim of circumstance, right? I think every time they geared up to replace that thing, something happened. And even every time they they geared up to update it, right? So we posted pre-COVID, we posted they were planning to update Indiana Jones with the next movie. Yeah. Obviously, with COVID, they just decided not to. So it was supposed to get new scenes. They just didn't end up bothering. Um but yeah, I think in the '90s it was it was definitely Indiana Jones Adventure was definitely envisioned for Hollywood Studios, and they talked about it. and And I think I don't know if it was Paris or well, I mean, well, I don't need to speculate. We can just ask these guys yeah. when, when we have them on stage. We'll figure this timeline out. But pretty sure Indiana Jones Adventure was supposed to come to Disney World, and then I don't know if they decided, oh, well, we could use that ride system for Animal Kingdom. Yeah, probably better. Yeah, it's interesting because really the idea of MGM Studios originates from Michael Eisner coming on board in yeah. mid '80s, right? And um, he allegedly was aware. Not of, allegedly, he this was is, aware that he had yeah. he had been approached at one point by uh, MCA when they were wanted to do like a a studio theme park, right? And uh, with Universal, and basically he was at Paramount, and they're like, "Yeah, come on and do they." He had seen what they wanted to do. Yeah. They wanted he, Paramount to be involved. Yeah. yeah, they wanted Paramount to be involved. Instead, Paramount got involved with uh, another theme park. They ended up buying the uh, the what Magic chain? Mountain or um, they bought um, so Kings Dominion Kings was there. Dominion? So I guess yeah. I don't know what group that was considered yeah. at the time, but yeah, they bought those parks. At any rate, essentially, then when Eisner takes over, the the guys at Universal or MCA are like, "Hey, do you still have interest in doing some sort of?" studio thing. And he's like, oh, we're already working on something. And then that kind of sparked this rivalry. Keep in mind, before then, Universal Studios Hollywood, like I went there as a kid, yeah. it was not a theme park. The Glamour Trams. It was, it was a, tour. a huge working studio yeah. that also had some guest-facing areas yeah. and the Glamour Trams, right? So that's probably the concept they had here, which was, hey, we're going to make a lot of movies in Florida. We'll have a working studio. It's yeah. kind of like, you know, maybe Florida can become like a Hollywood East. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, that has degraded to the point where, ne- like, they they were filming stuff here, yeah. uh, about both at Universal and at Disney. Uh, but right now, like, oh. Florida has shut down its, like, film development yeah. group. Uh, basically, we're one of, like, four or five states that doesn't have one at all. Mm. Right? So... There's no incentives, no economic incentives for people who yeah. want to make movies, et cetera. And uh, now Georgia basically, you know, I think all the, I don't know about all the Marvel movies, but a yeah. ton of the Marvel yeah. movies have been made in Atlanta and in Georgia. Uh, I think even New Orleans has a, kind of a, a, yeah. 
a blossoming film industry. I think, Florida's is kind of dead. Yeah, I think sounds. Yeah. The other thing that happened is I think sound stages were used less and less in mm-hmm. filmmaking, right? Like, don't get me wrong, they, people still use sound stages, um, but I think they were used less and less as the years went on. But the the thing was, I think uh, I think there was a noble effort in the '80s to to have sort of a Hollywood East yeah. between Universal and Disney. And a real concerted effort was made to to get people to come here. The dominoes never fell, though, right? It would have taken one or two big productions could have swayed everything, right? We could be sitting here today and talking about, you know, this being like the second hotbed of of production in the U.S., but the the chips didn't fall that way, right? Um, but yeah. they certainly could have if, you know, it, it could have taken just a handful of major productions to, to swing in our favor. But they didn't, yeah. and so things just slowly died as the years went on. Yeah. I, I mean, also, you could say that Georgia is a little bit my, more diverse, like, geographically than yeah. Florida. So there's a lot of things you can film there that you couldn't yeah. film here. Um, but Thunder in Paradise. Could yeah, be Thunder in Paradise. So that's good stuff there. Using the Morocco Pavilion at Epcot and the Living Seas at Epcot. And, yeah. yeah. And, and I don't know. It's possible that the state looked at it and thought, like, that's not who we are. Maybe yeah. we don't want to give out a bunch of these yeah. incentives. Uh, maybe some of these other states are, are better suited for this. I, yeah. I don't know. I think it's probably just was political at some point and whatever. But I know you could drive through Orlando and there's streets you see called like director's row. Yeah. Cause they anticipate like big warehouses to store like movie making equipment yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, the, this was a big deal back then and it was very important to Michael Eisner to get this done and get this across the line first. Yeah. Well, because people always come back to, oh, he stole Universal's idea. Universal was coming to Orlando to open a theme park where Disney World already had theme parks, right? They were they were coming into their territory to begin with. At that point, all bets are off. Like, this is, this is war. This is two businesses competing with each other. That's the way it's going to be. I mean, you could also say there's a – there are people that say that they created Animal Kingdom to – to hurt Bush Gardens, right? Yeah. Bush Gardens used to be much more animal centric than it is now. It's kind of just a roller coaster park. Yeah. But it used to be a lot of, you know, exhibits with animals and things like that. And Disney kind of, you know, Disney wanted to take a chunk. They go, you know what? Yeah. People are maybe maybe people are leaving. Maybe the people are coming for a couple of days and they're going to Tampa and going to Bush Gardens yeah. or they're gonna to go to this studio. Why don't we why don't we have all this yeah. so they can just stay here? Well, I think what was great about Disney World back then was the parks had purposes, right? So it's like, all right, we have Magic Kingdom, which is the, that's that's what Disney does. We build these castle parks. Then you know, Walt Stream was Epcot. They built sort of a permanent World's Fair, right? Then it became, uh, what about a working movie studio park, a park that celebrates movies and stage and and television and all of these things? And then I think they looked at it and were like, well, if we're going to do a fourth park, what what the hell do you do? And the answer was. A lot of people do nature, right? Like, we don't have a nature park, right? And it may very well be true that they wanted to steal Busch Gardens and SeaWorld's business. That's very likely. But at the same time, what what other themes were left, right? And I see people all the time going, oh, there should be a fifth park. What would the theme of a fifth park be other than... IPs, right? <laughs> like what? And he's seen with Epic, like Epic Universe. People are like, I love this theme. Like the theme is not anything. It's a way. Like you needed a vessel to connect a bunch of dissociated IPs, right? Right. That's that's all it is. I think it it looks like it's going to be a nice park, but it's not. Yeah. If you tell you know, if you told somebody in the in the mid nineties, hey, they're building Animal Kingdom. Yeah. And they go, well, what is that? You can very easily explain to them yeah. what sets it apart and makes it different. Same with studios, yeah. right? I don't know how you explain to someone what Epic Uni- what sets Epic Universe apart from yeah. any other theme park they've been to. Like at least other islands, than it's going to be new and like have Islands lots of, big of Adventure stuff. had an artistic vision, right? Mm-hmm. It was based on books, right? Yeah. All the all the islands are 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 books and literature, right? Jurassic yeah. Jurassic Park was the what Michael uh, Crichton, Michael right? Crichton, yeah. Um, you know, Seuss Landing, based on the Dr. Seuss books, Marvel's comic books, comic strips in Toon Lagoon. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, you know, obviously the Odyssey and all those sorts of things were um, in Lost Continent, right? Yeah. Um, the fantasy books, the fantasy genre. Obviously, also, those are things that inspired movies, and that's why they had a yes. place there. But, um, you know, and then if you try to explain Epic Universe as quickly as I just explained Islands of Adventure. You're not going to be able to be. No, it's and- like... Constellations with gates that open to various intellectual property lands. 
No, I think it'll, it'll make sense when you're in it. I don't yeah. know that it makes sense to, uh, trying to explain it But that's it to all someone. they want to build. That's all Disney wants to build. That's all any of them want to build now. So It's worth pointing out, by the way, that when Islands of Adventure opened, an hour down I-4, there was already a park called Adventure Island, which is the water park at Busch Gardens. Wow. I was really surprised when they chose that name. I felt like that yeah. was... I mean, I mean, now nobody even knows about Adventure Island. Frankly, even though I lived in Tampa, I don't even know if Adventure Island is still open. But they still have the water park. Yeah, do they? I, did well, they maybe. change the name? No, I don't think so. Oh, it's still there. It's not very well known, but it so, exists. Uh, some of our wigs said for Fifth Park Marvel or Villains. That's those are both pretty narrow. I don't know that you could do a whole park. Of I don't know, like a like again. Uh, the reason you don't want a whole Harry Potter park or a whole Star Wars park or a whole Marvel park is because it's the it's narrow. Focus. You need something for everybody. You need something for everybody. There's people. There's inevitably going to be people that are like, I don't like Marvel. I don't want to go to that park. Right? Disney. What was it? I think Raleigh Crump said the Disney parks are like, like a, a salad. salad. You have to have something for everybody. Right? The lettuce and the croutons and the cucumbers and the the dressing. There's something in there for everybody. And if you build a park with a singular Focus in like one movie or one franchise. I think, I think it works. I think Tokyo Disney Sea did something creative with their theming and how yeah. it is, how it's based on this sort of, I mean, fictional society of explorers, adventurers. You get into all yeah. these things that they have there. I think that's really creative. Yeah. Well, the original, if you look at the original theme there too, right? It's like, well, there's Disneyland, and then someone just like looked at the obvious, and it's, well, what the obvious of land is uh, the opposite of land is sea. Yeah. So a sea park, and what do you do at a sea park? Like ports of call, and what yeah. are what are the interesting ports of call? And then yeah. so like you you build a park from there, right? I think it's it's the most natural progression, right? And that's why I think uh, people already speculating at a third park there. They're like, well, it has to be Disney Sky then, and it kind of does, right? It has to be land, sea, and sky, right? Yeah. So um, they're the ones who did it right. Surprise, um, but Disney World didn't do it wrong either because you had four very individual parks, four parks with completely different themes and purposes and most importantly, mission statements, right? Like the Magic Kingdom has its mission statement at the front, right? Here you leave today under the world of yesterday, tomorrow, and yeah. fantasy. Epcot Center was to inform and inspire. Um, in MGM, it was to take you to the Hollywood that always was and never will, but never will be. Yeah. And take you behind the scenes of, of how production works to lift the curtain. If you will, and then Animal Kingdom was to help you discover the the you know the natural world. Now now they're all homogenous you know IP parks, but yeah, but they used to all have very. It's harder to see, but it's still yeah. there. What was unique right. and cool about Disney World was four parks with very different mission statements. Each day of your trip was something very very different. Hollywood Studios slash MGM Stu Disney MGM Studios yeah uh, is probably the one with the least DNA remaining. Right of its original construction, yeah, I would say. Um, Which is, I don't think anybody feels like exists. they're in a studio anymore. No, you know they're not. They don't feel like they're on a on a back lot. They don't no. feel like there's a buzz. You know, they don't even have the people pretending to be making movies yeah. there anymore. And so I think that's a thing that a lot of people miss. And I know we're going to get into this. I don't know where to start. We have the genesis. We have the opening. Well, we talked timeline. about the studio part already, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and we talked about Universal, and, and that's that's the beginning. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, what they built in the beginning was not meant to be a full-day park. It was a half-day experience. where A boutique park. Yeah, right. So there was the Backlot Studio Tour, which loaded from, um, you know, if you're not of a certain age group, you're probably like, oh, the ba I know where the Backlot Tour loaded. It was, it was towards the back of the park in that big warehouse building. That's not where it loaded from in the beginning. Uh, the Magic of Disney Animation, that, that entrance that. Yep. building. If you've ever walked in there, you walk into Launch Bay and you look to the left once you go under the sign, there's a lot of queue space. If you've ever wondered why there's all that queue space, yeah. that's because that's where you queued for the tram tour. So part one was a tram tour that took you through the back lot. So you went through the back lot. You saw Residential Street costuming, all of those things. Then you got off the tram for part two. In part two, you could have like a little pause in the middle where you could eat at a uh, studio catering company. You could go to the Looney Bin, which was this interactive sort of like sort of Toon Toontown took a lot from it yeah. later on. Um, you lift boxes and they make noise and there's safes falling and 
all that kind of stuff. The dip truck from Roger Rabbit was was out there on the tram tour nearby. Um, that was sort of your break in between. But then there was a second half of the tour, uh, with the walking portion, where you went through you know the tank, which eventually became yeah. the pre show for the studio tour later. Yes, um, when it when it was Pearl Harbor. Um, but oh boy. Yeah. I forgot. I had blocked that out of my memory, you had? the Pearl Harbor thing. Yeah. So I just remember being in the tank and wearing the raincoat and the yeah. hat and getting Well, they did that splashed. in both of yeah. them. But there was the tank, and then you walked through actual sound stages, and then you arrived where they would show the dailies. They would show you clips of what had been produced right. like very recently at the park, as if you were a studio executive seeing the dailies, what had been worked on in your studio, where there was this really cute little film with Michael Eisner and Mickey Mouse yeah. where they're like getting everyone in the studio together, like turn a bog and everybody yeah. is getting together and they all sit in the room and then the, the lights dim and the screen goes on and you watch the dailies as if you're watching them yeah. with them. Uh, and that was the end of your tour, but it was a, a couple hour long experience. Yeah. Uh, and then the other half of the park, you had great movie ride. You could go see superstar television, you could go see monster sound show. And a couple of months later, you could see the Indiana Jones epic stunt spectacular. Right. Um, and then eventually by year's end, you could see Star Tours, which would be the only the second. I mean, third, with the tram tour, third, the third ride in the park. But that was it. But very quickly, like the park was at capacity every day. And they realized, oh, oh man, we have a hit on our hand. We better green light a bunch of expansion for this very quickly. Um, and so I think another thing you'll hear about at Stage 89 is I, I am sure it is inevitable that all these people worked on 500 things that did not see the light of day because everyone was just throwing everything at a wall to see what would stick. And some things did. Muppet Vision 3D, Voyage of the Little Mermaid. Um, obviously, the stage shows continue to change out. Dick Tracy, Beauty and I the do Beast. Recall, I do recall seeing Beauty and the Beast on Sunset Boulevard. You mean on Hollywood Boulevard? It was on Sunset used to be on Hollywood. Was it Hollywood? So the theater, the stars used to be. I know it wasn't in where the theater is, on the street, like kind of by the Tower of Terror, or looking towards the Tower of Terror. If you know where Starbucks is, between Starbucks and the tip, what was the tip board, I'm dating myself, Um, the trolley stop, if you will. Um, That street wasn't there. Sunset Boulevard wasn't there. I just call it Sunset, because that's where we are. So there was no street. The theater just sat there. It just sat right there. I saw Beauty and the Beast there in like 1991, 1992. Yeah. Yeah. So when uh, it debuted the day the movie came out in 91, and then very quickly they were like, oh, we're going to build Sunset. Mm-hmm. So they leveled that theater. In the meantime, Beauty and the Beast moved to the Backlot Theater and performed there for a little bit until Sunset Boulevard opened in 94. But, yeah, I mean, that, those first couple of years they just – Yeah, Backlot Theater. I every year there was Tarzan something there, new. I think. Didn't they have a Tarzan show there? That was Animal Kingdom. No. Backlot Theater was Beauty and the Beast – uh, then I believe, I think the next thing was Pocahontas. It might have been Pocahontas I saw that. And then Hunchback. Yeah, you're those right. Those were the three I get. I do get those three there. confused just because I'm a... Tarzan Rocks was Animal King. Yeah. It was, yeah. Not, it was not Tarzan Rocks. No. I just had my head examined. It's okay. You know, it's been, I've been, I've, I spent two days in the car with Jason Diffendall. I know. I know. That's going to be my excuse for anything I screw up today. But yeah, there wasn't a lot to do. Um, and then very quickly they tried to add... Things until the, so those first five years, which is what we're going to focus on at Stage 89, are a wild time because again, then there's all the things they didn't build right: a Roger Rabbit Land, a Muppet Land, Dick Tracy's Crime Stoppers, um, which was a shooting ride, the Imagine Mel Brooks golf cart really, ride. Well, we're going to talk about that for mm-hmm. sure because um, that's the roots of Tower of Terror. But like Dick Tracy's Crime Stoppers, which certainly would not have survived till today because people were armed with Tommy guns in a car shooting people, that would that would have not made it. But uh, I mean, we do that to Zerg. That's not a Tommy gun. It's a fake yeah. laser gun, and he doesn't like die, right? Yeah. I think in the Dick Tracy ride, if it had been built as intended, you would have shot people, and they would have went, "Oh!" <laughs> like, like they would have actually died. Wow. I think. I could be wrong, but I think that's what would have happened. Yeah, who knows? But uh, one thing that has endured, though, that's worth a quick mention is m- many of the restaurants. Yeah. Impeccably themed restaurants. Yeah. Maybe the best in all of Walt Disney World in terms of I think so. adherence to a theme mm-hmm. and where the the uh, the restaurant tells a story, the food kind of goes right along with it, and yeah. where you really feel like they nailed it. And I, I I can't think of anywhere else where they really nailed almost every restaurant. You're, this is the height of Imagineering, right? This period is Disneyland Paris and this park and Tower of Terror and Indiana Jones and 
this is a really great era, right? And you see, like, this is the park where we start to see that insane level of storytelling break through, right? So just look at, maybe the food doesn't necessarily tell the story, but look at Backlot Express. Yeah. Backlot Express, to if you walk in there, people will just be like, oh, it's a storage space. And, and you walk away, but there's so many layers of story in there, right? There's a seating area. There's a countertop that's it's the paint station. Yeah. So there's like faint, fake paint buckets all over. And um, there were other – they've ripped a lot out of there over the years. But there used to be like – the divider in the middle of the room would be like a workstation with cabinets and the yeah. fake sink. There's still a couple of the fake sinks in there. Um, there are legit production photographs from like Davy Crockett and a bunch of stuff sitting in the back. If you if you walk in from the side by Star Tours and go straight back, there's this like what do you what do you call like that the poster display with the with the you could move the yeah I don't know I what don't they're really calling. Talking about. But they have one of those, and it's all like old Disney production photographs, and they're real. Yeah. And you can just go back there, like go behind that table and just actually look through them. It's it's the real deal. You're eating in a space that is very much accurately themed to the nines to what it's supposed to be. Right. And and that is not the one people think of, probably. People no. are probably going to think about sci-fi. Primetime. Primetime. Derby. Brown Derby. Yeah. Yeah, I was a big fan of the Catwalk Bar when it existed. Yeah. Now I have been up there since it became Club Thirty Three. Yeah. I, it, I don't like it as much. What's wild? Club Thirty Three is very nice, but it kind of has a Mad Men feel. Yeah. The Catwalk you could actually kind of see out there, and it was. I don't know. It's just What's that. wild is even though they rethemed that heavily, that Club Thirty Three, it's still the same shape. So like the bar is where the bar was. Yeah. So like that's still the Catwalk Bar. Bar, it's yeah. still there. That's what I like about it. But yeah, you're right. It, I mean, it is it, the fact that they've sealed it in and they gave it this Art Deco, you know, mid-century modern. Yeah, it's, it's, it's somewhere between the 30s and the 60s, yeah. right? It it, it 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 sort of phases through those those decades, um, but probably more mid-century modern. You're probably right. Yeah, I, the the restaurants I think are just part of this story, right? There's so yeah. I mean, even. You know, places like Starring Rolls, may it rest in peace. Yeah, you know they we just, just they the just took the sign down. What seven years? Mm, yeah, it was closed seven. for seven years before they took the sign down. So I don't know. I still I still like going to those places. They're even though I don't always love. I don't always love the food. We're talking about sci-fi, right? <laughs> Sci-fi in particular. Because the new menu at primetime we really liked. Yeah, I mean, so the thing at primetime is you can look at your plate and be like, wow, it is just a massive brown, mm -hmm. which I kind of like. It suits the yeah. it suits the theme of the restaurant and the food is fine. But it's um, it's not like your mouth starts watering for some of the food there. You're kind of like, okay, we're going to get Peanut butter and jelly milkshake, my mouth. The peanut butter and jelly milkshake yeah. is good, but, good. Um, you know, I think it's, appro it's appropriate for the time period and yeah. the – theming and what they serve, it's great. And in general, you know, I can't think of any, I don't have any complaints about the dining options at Hollywood Studios. There's plenty for everybody. My brother used to say that the worst burger on property was at the ABC commissary, but I'm pretty sure it was the same burgers everywhere else. It just tasted worse there for some reason. Yeah. I don't know. That's a lot different now. Um, fun Brown Derby thing I like to tell people because people don't know. If you ever look at the booths, between the booths, there's a phone jack. And you may wonder why there's a phone jack there. It's because the, at the real Brown Derby, there would be important Hollywood executives, and sometimes people would need to reach them. So they'd come with a phone, plug it in the wall, Mr. Blah, 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 there's a call for you. You could, at the opening of the Brown Derby, request the phone and make a phone call from your table. Oh, that's pretty great. They That faded away with time to the point at which they threw the phone in a closet. No one knew to ask for it. And then some managers opened a closet and found a phone and was like, what is this? And they threw it away. It they seems threw the pretty phone. on brand. They threw the phone out because no one knew what it was. Yeah. Um, I do recall eating at restaurants as a young teenager going out with friends. And there was more than one restaurant, but the one in particular where you ordered – Using a phone at the table. Oh, Those really? The days. Yeah, you pick up the phone and be like, I'll have the nachos, please. Wow. Yeah. It's like Listen. Sonic. You pull in, you hit the button. Yeah, but this was indoors yeah. and nobody yeah. wore skates. Wow. And there was no confusion about whether or not you're tipping them. That's a whole thing, by the way. I 
apparently there's controversy about tipping people at Sonic. Did you not know this? I mean, it's a fast food restaurant. And... Yeah, but they bring your food out to you on skates. And so... Are they allowed to take them? Yeah, they can oh, take they tips. Are. Okay. It used to be like some people just tip their spare change. Some people feel pressure to do 20%. And so I read this long thread. I think it was Reddit or something a long time ago. And this guy's like, absolutely not. I will not tip there. I worked at Sonic for, you know, 11 years. They never tipped out any of the other people that worked in the kitchen or worked anywhere else. They never paid us oh, anything. Yeah. And they made more than, like, tipped minimum wage. They made, like, real minimum wage. Yeah. And uh, so th- that guy was pretty upset about it. I, I could see it both ways. But I definitely well, that's not right. Yeah, if you're getting tipped and you don't tip out to your, yeah, you know, to the people inside, then you shouldn't be getting it to begin with. I'm I'm with that guy on that note because the the rule is you have to tip out. You have to take care of the people elsewhere in the in the restaurant that that facilitate your job. Yeah, I actually ate at Sonic recently for the first time in years. Yeah, it's not bad. Can I get that cherry limeade? Mm. Natural break. I don't know what you want. <laughs> we want to say about. I don't know what to say about sci-fi at this point. We don't have to talk about sci-fi. We can, start, um, we can go to attractions and get going on. Yeah. So that the park was. It was a. It was a weird thing in the early days, but people loved it. It was a huge hit, and um, yeah, I think I the park. The earliest I really remember the park is like around when Tower opened. That that's when I I have stronger memories. But a lot of the original park was still there at that point. To me, Tower of Terror is what took, like, theming to the next level. Yeah. To me, they, they've they never blown my mind with theming the way they did when Tower of Terror opened. Yeah. And you went in there, and you were fully immersed in this story, and you could feel it. And then you go into a boiler room that made it even cooler. Yeah. And that was, to me, like, that was note perfect. Everything about that, the original Tower of Terror was perfect. Yeah. And even now, like, theming-wise, it's fantastic. It hasn't gotten worse, I don't think. Some things don't work anymore. But I think in general, like, you walk up to that building, it's still intimidating. You walk in, it's still interesting. You know, you there's still foreboding. I mean, when you do something that good, I don't think it ever ages. Yeah. Like Pirates and Mansion, right? Like, you could certainly update them here and there over time, but it never goes out of style, right? Pirates and Mansion have a great theme. Um, and, and they are distinct and well executed. But something about the Tower of Terror made me feel I was, like, in a real place. I didn't feel like I was in a theme park ride. I felt like I was in a real hotel. And I think that's the difference. Yeah. I don't know. And, look, there's been other things. A lot of stuff that Universal did with Harry Potter in particular, very well themed. The queue for Dueling Dragons, I think, was fantastic Yeah. Uh, when I did that. But also Universal has a tendency to, like, care about the theme until they don't. Right, be like, hey, I feel like I'm fully immersed in this thing, and like, hey, look, a dinosaur themed roller coaster just zipped past me. Yeah. You know, um, let's go get a butter beer, and the roller coaster goes right by your seat. Yeah, yeah, that is a thing that happens. Some people care about that, some people don't. Um, but I, you know, undoubtedly, it takes you out of the theme. Yeah. Now, whether or not that's important to you is is another consideration altogether. Um, but I think Tower of Terror more than any other attraction that I have been to. I mean, there have been others since then that have taken it to the next level, but that's the one that when it was new was like, wow, this is something else. Yeah. This is something else. Again, that's that's a real golden age, right? You look at Disneyland Paris was two years before that, and you start to see that level. And then Tower, Indiana Jones, like that's a real strong period of time. Yeah. So I know that you have this deep, lifelong affinity for the great movie ride. Was it always your favorite attraction at Hollywood Studios? Yeah. At that park, yeah. I don't know that it was always my favorite attraction at Disney World. I don't think it was because of Figment. Um, but then as I got older, it definitely was. Like as as Fig- when Figment faded away, I think then – so Epcot was my favorite park as a child, right? Right. Then they obliterated it. And then I found as I got into my teenage years, I fell in love with studios, and I really liked that park. So the next – era of my life was studios is my favorite park. I love this aesthetic. I like these attractions. I like this vibe. I love these restaurants. That became my park. And then similar to Epcot, they took that all away from me. <laughs> so 
I don't pick favorite parks anymore except Disney Sea because I generally believe that that will remain intact. <laughs> I can, I'm safe with that one. That's happened to me in my life though, where Magic Kingdom, Epcot, and Hollywood Studios, or whatever it was named at yeah. the time, rotated, kind of being my favorite parks, mm. depending on a number of factors. You know, but you know, Epcot has changed a lot, but but also Epcot feels the same in the back of the park. Yeah. Um, Studios is completely different, yeah. but still maintains this vibe. So I still yeah. will contend, and and a lot of people probably won't agree because they'll say Magic Kingdom or something else. But I think at night the vibe on Hollywood Boulevard, like that is just that classic feel. It's hard to top. It's the best Main feeling. Street. Yeah, I think it's the Hollywood best. Hollywood Sunset yeah. and Echo Lake is the best Main Street of I, any park. I agree with you. I think I agree, especially at night. Yeah. Especially at night. During the day, you kind of realize that it's kind of a short, <laughs> short walk down that street, you know. But, yeah. but I think the whole area, when you when you get into it at night, yeah. you know, especially when Pluto's Tail is wagging on the neon sign. and The Mouse About the, Town sign with the cane. I mean. Yeah. I, I just can't think of anything better. Gertie. You know, you don't have that post fireworks euphoria walking down <laughs> that you would have yeah. walking down Main Street or you know walking out of Epcot. Mm. But there's something special about there. They really they really nailed that. Yeah. And I think you can feel echoes of that when you go to DCA now. For, A little bit, yeah. Yeah, for the entrance area there and all the way to Carthay Circle. And yeah. that vibe again is really special. And I think that uh, they should be commended for that. It's not just attractions, right? It's it's storytelling and making people feel something. Mm-hmm. And I think Hollywood Studios slash MGM Studios really makes people feel that. It had its, its own feel. identity, for yeah. sure, and its own feel. Um, yeah. When you leave Universal, by contrast, it just kind of feels like you're being herded towards an exit. Yeah. Like, stop oh, these US, gift shops. USF is the ugliest park I've ever been in. The, the, the ugliest major theme park in, in the world. I, there are charming parts of that park. Um, I like the, like, New York, some of those, like, grimy Sting New York. Sting Alley, yeah. Uh, uh, street, yeah. yeah, Sting Alley. Um, I, there are charming parts of that park. Uh, but in general, it's kind of, especially when you're leaving, like, yeah. Or entering, you just don't feel anything because it's just a store, right? Like there's no yeah. coherence up there. There's a Today Show cafe and a store. Like Today Show is filmed in New York, so that's New York themed, but it's removed from the New York section. Where in the New York section they built the building in which the show is filmed, the Today Show. Yeah, <laughs> underneath Jimmy Fallon. Yeah, that bottom is supposed to be where they filmed the Today yeah. Show. Um, so it's real disconnected. And there's no like you, you have that giant. Outdoor amphitheater, like that main boulevard is horrendous. I think part of it also is like the the whole Despicable Me and Minion yeah. stuff just doesn't feel premium. Yeah, I realize these movies, um, a lot of people go to them and they they make a lot of money. Those two, but I also don't think it lends though. itself to like carrying a theme of a whole region of a park. And I think that whole entrance, you know, compared that to Hollywood Studios. Now, they have their own kind of Hollywood section that's not bad at Universal. Yeah. They have their own Brown Derby. It's not bad. Um, but it doesn't I, – I don't think it – I think they missed the mark a little yeah. bit there, especially just when you get to leave. The, the inexperience showed, right? Disney had people that trained under, you know, the, the people who started the art form. And you see that carry over in MGM. Um, you see Universal, like – it had it had, that park had its moments, but there were a lot of mistakes made because they just didn't know what they were doing. They they entered a line of business they had not been in, right? Like they they had third party companies build rides that didn't know what they were doing. That led to giant lawsuits. Jaws had to be rebuilt. Kong never worked so much so that that first year people were very often given like no questions asked new tickets. They gave you yeah. tickets that were good for like another year. They're like, please come back because we're clearly not ready for you now, but maybe we will be in a year. I mean, the biggest draw there seemed to be Nickelodeon at the time, right? Yeah. You go get slimed and all that kind of yeah. stuff. That worked. That worked. <laughs> Hanna-Barbera though, man. Oh, Hanna-Barbera. I went to a Hanna-Barbera theme park once. Canada's Wonderland. I don't know if it still That's, is, was but, also under but when I went, it was, yeah, banner, yeah, all those Hanna-Barbera characters. Yeah. Kind of fun. It's funny. Was Jabberjaw, was he a— He's uh, Hanna-Barbera. Yeah, he, yeah, they should have had him with Jaws, you know. Hey! Jabberjaws. <laughs> Jabberjaws. Wow. 
He had like an old timey voice, didn't he? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was Jabberjaw was not one of my favorite Hanna Barbera cartoons. No. No. Wacky races, Scooby Doo, um, even some of the weird offbeat stuff like the Secret Squirrel. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones. Anything with Dick Dastardly is great, though. I, I know he had his own series. Penelope Pitstop had her own series. We're getting way off track. We're way off track. We're but way the studios off track. parks. There's a there's a connection. Yeah, there's a um, connection. Were you ever a participant in Superstar Television? Did no. you ever get to be on the stage? Nope. What about the Backlot Tour? No. Nothing? I regret it. I had the chance the last day, and I didn't. Nick ended up going, because we knew someone that worked there. So Nick ended up being in it, and I filmed it, um, because I had to film it for the last day. Um, but I never got to actually do it. I should have done it that day. I don't know why I didn't. Oh, Uptown Ed said, I'm a bit surprised that MGM never had a Tam O'Shanter. That would have been pretty cool. They probably didn't want to upset the Tam. <laughs> they still have my credit card from last year when we ate there. The Tam I left it good. behind. I like the Tam. It was fantastic. Yeah. What a great, what, a place that lived up to its like low-key hype. I, I knew you were going to love it, and you were like so eh about it till we got in there, and then you're like, oh, I get this now. I wasn't eh about it. I you was and Walt Disney had the same diet, so yeah. so I knew you were going to like it. Yeah, that's true. Maybe that's secretly why I left my credit card there. Just There'll always be a little piece of me. There'll always be a little piece of me at the TAM. TAM. I love it. So you never participated in any of this stuff? No. Universal, though, I was in several times I was in the Ghostbusters pre-show. Oh, boy. Where they would recruit people, and I was also in Earthquake. Well, there you have it. There are photos somewhere. I'll send Billy the photos from those two. That's great. Yeah. So, anyway, we fast forward and we start to lose some of these attractions, right? Some are changed, like the Backlot Tour is changed. Yeah, they separate the walking tour. They, the walking tour becomes its own separate attraction and then eventually gets phased away over the years. Um you know, for Lights and Motors Action, they then got rid of Residential Street. The Backlot Tour just slowly faded away, right, piece by piece. Right. Kind of like the Tomorrowland Speedway, where every time they wanted to do something, they took, like, a little bit of track away, essentially, is yeah. what happened to the Backlot Tour. But then also, like, New York Street became an area you could walk around. Um, you know, they built the playground, you know. The first weird decision to me, I mean, there were some weird decisions that some of these just had to be made, right? They were uncomfortable or whatever was uh, the addition of Lights, Motors, Action. Yeah. I feel like that's a massive amount of real estate that they could have done almost anything with. I think they and were looking for the easy answers at that point. The easy answer was we just spent all this money on a studios park in Paris that has failed miserably. What could we emulate from there? And they looked at that and were like, oh, people all like that. Let's, em let's rebuild this stunt show. I, I liked the show. The first time I saw it, I was like, oh, that was pretty awesome. Yeah. But at no point was I like... This is going to become a thing I do every time I come no, to this park. Too long. Too long. You're sitting in a massive, like, Not stadium. Repeatable. Yeah. I don't know. I saw a – we went to the soft opening in March of 05. And they said, like, this is a preview performance. We're working out the kinks, blah, blah, blah. We were in there for an hour and a half. It took them that long to reset stuff because they were still learning. And at that point, I'm sitting there like, why are you, why are you open? Like, this should be with cast members. You should not make a guest sit here for 90 minutes of this. This is too much. Yeah. Um, and from that moment on, I never fell in love with that show. Like I saw it, I probably saw it only three or four more times at Disney World. I think I saw it twice in Paris just because the novelty, it already closed in Florida. And I was like, oh, I know it's going to go here too, so I might as well see it. These stunt shows take up too much space. Yeah. Yeah, I know they want they want to take up some of your time. Yeah. Right, keep you in the park. But I felt like that was just something that, it diminished every time I saw it, yeah. and it wasn't anything that had any kind of repeatability. They didn't, they didn't make any major changes to it. I mean, I'm sure they made minor changes here and there, but the way I recall it was kind of seeing the same show over time. Yeah, I'm trying to think where exactly in Galaxy's Edge that is now. I think it's slightly. It's probably like Rise of the Resistance and the X Wing. Yeah. Um, leading up to the market, it's a lot of that space, I think, because it was straight. It was kind of straight up the street. Yeah. So if you eliminate like half of Grand or uh, Streets of America, and then, yeah, so somewhere somewhere around that area, somewhere right in the middle of Galaxy's Edge. 
And at, the, at that point, you know that they've given up on being a, a movie studio, right? Well, I mean, that was still production themed. Yeah. That still fit the theme. But you could hear, actually, Jake just said it. You could hear those cars throughout the whole park. Mm. Nobody's going to film a movie there when you have to contend with that kind of well, noise. They were already they had already been out of production. Yeah. In, the, in the late 90s, they like officially gave up. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, so then the addition of Toy Story Land, just to twist the knife a oh, little God, bit God, you're more. going. You jumped. You jumped. Well, these are the major, m- major things. Well, Toy Story Mania was first, right? Like, that's the beginning. I think that, like, late 2000 shift right after Lights, Motors, Action is when you start to see where the park's going. So you have Toy Story Mania, American Idol Experience, Block Party Bash, New Star Tours, that group is like, okay, we're starting to reinvent this park. We don't have a great idea of where it's going, but at the least we're going to put some money in this park so people care about it again. Because attendance was down in that park for sure. Um, I think post 9-11, it's the, one of the four Disney World parks that had the hardest time bouncing back. Because um, I don't think people felt there was a lot of good reasons to go there. Um, and we skipped over Rock and Roller Coaster too, but that was... I think Rock and Roller Coaster through to like Star Tours 2 is their attempt to sort of revive it. It's like, yeah, it's still movie-themed, but no actual production. Like, can we continue the theme without actually making film or television at the studio? Who made that decision? I don't know. I think it was a natural one. I think they just stopped the the warehouse, the, the soundstage just stopped being booked, right? So, you know, for, actually, the, the first step is late 90s, they make that decision, and the first thing they did was shove Who Wants to Be a Millionaire Play It, in one of those sound stages that lasted five years, and then they decided, well, this sound stage is actually big enough for a ride, and then they yeah. put Toy Story Mania in it, and then of course a couple years later, the third track of Toy Story Mania goes in the adjacent sound stage. So two of those original sound stages became Toy Story, Toy Story. and that'll always be a cool thing because look, Toy Story Land will probably be there for twenty or thirty years, and it's wild that when that park turns like fifty or sixty, there'll still be two sound stages sitting there. They just aren't part of your experience, but they're there. They're yeah. like the exterior, like the back, the, the whole exterior of those sound stages still exists. Yeah. They're still very much those buildings, but there's something else in them. But they just, the, we just kept the shell because it was necessary to, you know, to not build a new structure for a, a ride we wanted to build. Um, if you've ever been like backstage there, there are some areas, um, for instance, uh, I think when I, I had a VIP tour. I went on one time or whatever. Some of those office buildings back there have a still really cool, like the Art Deco style. The animation the, offices. Yeah, the yeah. animation offices. I think I think that's amazing. And that's room for them to do something one day maybe if they decide what to do. You know, If they can find another place for some of these people to work. Because I think that po- that's amazing. I, Same thing when you go into like Launch Bay. Yeah. We went in there. Remember, you and I, were, we're live streaming. This is like kind of during covid times. Yeah. And we went back into like... They had an area like back in Launch Bay that was like just to go hang out in the air conditioning yeah. area and like to go back in there and look at kind of that old queue area. Yeah. All that stuff is really cool. Yeah. I I think you should enjoy that space while you can. Yeah. I think so. Care to I don't know anything. I don't know it's not an area where I go when I go to the studio. I would go say goodbye to it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You might have some time, but no, probably not. Poor studios. Look, it's a safe bet, right? The the mermaid, there's a reason they're reviving Mermaid as a new show, right? It's to bring some life into that area. And I, I It think, is dead. I think you you can imagine if you're gonna re- bother reviving that area, if you're gonna keep that area and not level the whole thing, then it would be a safe bet to say something's gonna happen to that launch bay building. Yeah. And the space behind it. Yeah. I remember the uh, original animation tour. Uh, they were allegedly, uh, I remember you could see what they were working on. They were allegedly working on Beauty and the Beast. They had the they had some of the cells out there. Yeah. The, the movie was probably already mostly done. Yeah. So, But they had people there drawing as if they were drawing Beauty and the Beast. So several things were actually animated there, right? Yeah. The, the Roger Rabbit shorts, what, yeah. Tummy Trouble and, I um, forget the other one, were actually fully produced at MGM. Mm-hmm. Then there were full segments of movies produced at MGM later. So Mulan, I want to say Mulan, Brother Bear, and Lilo and Stitch had full segments that were produced in Florida. I forget if there's any other ones, but those three I know for sure because um, 
we used to do a pin podcast, part of WWNT. Uh, and several of the pin artists we used to talk to who worked at Disney, that's where they started, was at the Disney Animation um, in Florida. And then they've, when that closed, they just moved over to like Disney Design Group and merchandise, and they did the art for that stuff. And I know because we'd interview them, and it, like, so like our good friend Monty Maldivan, he worked on, I know he worked on Mulan. It, it was fun later on to look for them in the credits. Like a lot of those Florida people were in the credits because there were little sections of those movies were actually produced at that studio. Yeah, of course there was the uh, oh Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears edition of the Mickey Mouse Club. Yeah, Christina Aguilera and Ryan Gosling. Who else? A lot of famous yeah. people. A lot of a lot of famous people there back in the day. And uh, I never saw a taping of that show. But let's I know make that a happened. deal. Yeah. Oh God, let's make a deal. WCW filmed a lot at the MGM Studios. WCW Saturday Night. Um, there were several tapings of Nitro that happened that were not. In a soundstage, they're actually out in the entrance area. Um, and at the very famous time, the height, we're talking about the beginning of the height. Just the Wolf Pack and no, the we're NWO. Before, we're before that. Okay. The, the week the NWO was formed, they, that's when they filmed at MGM Nitro outside. And very famous story, um, because again, this was, this was uh, re- professional wrestling had been real cartoony, right? It was these characters, Vince McMahon's. WWE right. was, you know, Duke the Dumpster Drozzy, Doink the Clown. Everyone had a job, right? That was how they gave you characters. It was for children. But even children at the time were like, this is beneath me, right? So WCW decides we're going to go for realism. And those nitros were held. They threw Rey Mysterio headfirst into a production trailer. This had never been done before. They'd never shown people, like, fighting backstage. And it looked like a real street fight. So they threw him into a production trailer. It looked so real that local Orlando residents called the police to go to the Disney MGM studios. So the police showed up at the show because no one had seen anything like that before. I remember seeing a long time ago in the 80s, I think it was Geraldo Rivera. Mm. No, I'm sorry. Another guy with the mustache, John Stossel. Okay, he can. He was doing something about professional wrestling, and some oh, yeah. wrestler I've never heard of, six foot six guy. He tells them that he thinks it's fake, and the yeah. guy, the guy like hit him. Not a super famous a, guy. I know you're a few about, times. Yeah. The guy hit him a few times and chased him. It was a big him, lawsuit. Like, it was a big thing. Like, yeah, that's the only time I had seen fighting backstage. Yeah, you know, until yeah, WCW, Ray Mysterio. He well, wore a mask, were, right? Was he they a were still protecting the business back then. He still had the mask, yeah. yeah. They were still protecting the business back then. It was it was still sacrilegious to admit it was predetermined, right? Um, and so, I mean, that word is still, uh, funny enough, this week, um, they're in Australia. And um, an Australian news outlet was talking to one of the wrestlers, Austin Theory, and used the word fake. And he went off on him and threatened to, like, beat him up. And I'm like... Yeah, you wouldn't want someone to say you, your job is fake, right? Like they're, they are, you know, they're performers and they work incredibly hard. Um, whether it's predetermined or not, like you shouldn't disrespect. People's Nobody walked jobs. up to like Lawrence Olivier after a performance and was like, "Yeah, hey, that was fake." Just because yeah. it's predetermined, it's they're incredibly talented people. Yeah. Like it's it's an incredibly taxing form of work, right? Like these people are decrepit by the time they're. Look 50, how many 60, of them died. Years old. That was that's because the '80s drug use. They, their life expectancy is on the rise now because the, the sport cleaned up quite a bit. Yeah. Sport, sports entertainment, professional wrestling, whatever you want to call it. I don't mean mm-hmm. to take us on a wrestling. People never know where, when wrestling is going to pop up on this show because well, Tom is uh, not so secretly a huge fan yeah. because we talked about the Von Erich movie. But there was always a connection, right? The I Iron mean, like, Claw. As a kid, like, there was this connection, like, oh, MG, like, we're watching Hulk Hogan on TV, and he's in um, Thunder in Paradise, and it's like, oh, that's definitely Epcot. That's Living Seas. That's the Grand Floridian at the end of the show. They're on the beach hanging out at the Grand. It was a part of life. And then also, like, honestly, one of the biggest moments in the history of the business, when Hulk Hogan signed with WCW, they had a ticker tape parade on New York Street. At the MGM Studios, and you'll watch, he signs the contract and holds it up in front of the, remember the arch that was at the end of the street? And that is, that's a moment that gets shown all the time in documentaries and stuff. And it's, so those, MGM lives on. Another thing. So in the 90s, WCW Monday Nitro, one of the most highest rated shows in all of cable television, right? 
they're doing incredible numbers. You ever see the opening of Monday Nitro where there's like a dark street and there's explosions and I don't know. I watched. It's, I remember when Goldberg was yeah. it was just the Goldberg time. Yeah, thing? sure. Yeah, that's New York Street. It's the streets of America. They okay. filmed that on the streets. So that whole famous opening where they're projecting video onto the buildings and there's explosions with the signs and everything. It's New York Street at Disney MGM Studio. There is, and I didn't realize this until I started working in this business. Hmm. A there are a large number of people who are big Disney fans and big wrestling fans. Yeah, there's crossover for sure. Is it just the fantasy? Is it the storytelling? I is think it... it's a level of storytelling, right? I think like real sports are great and, and you you wait. I think you wait all season in real sports for those moments, right? Those moments where it's like bottom of the ninth. And you have to pray they happen, right? You, you get that to, every week. You have on to like pray Raw, for yeah. Game Seven, bottom of the ninth. Patrick Mahomes in overtime in the yeah. Super Bowl. Yeah, those don't happen because it's you know a lot of things have to go a certain way for yeah. those moments to happen. When you control the sport, those moments can happen all the time. What I always say about pro wrestling. <laughs> Is when it's bad, it is the worst thing you've ever watched. And when it's good, it's the best thing you've ever watched. So it is when it's bad, it's painful. But when it's good, it's oh, it's incredible. I didn't realize there was so much wrestling DNA in in the MGM. Disney's Hollywood studios. Oh yeah, a ton. Yeah. Wow. The um And now they film wrestling at Universal. If you watch some early shows, if you watch like the original Mickey Mouse Club. Right. Um, there's a lot of sequences with this like turntable where they have like spinning sets. So that was it cost a lot of money to install that. Then they they left. WCW was coming in. Bob Allen, who we had a golden jamboree, the son of the Disney legend, Bob Allen, right. his son, ran production at MGM. And so he's in charge of that. The rotating thing is there. Eric Bischoff from WCW comes to them. They're working out how they're going to film there. And they tour the space, and they're like, well, yeah, the Mickey Mouse Club and the other productions left this big rotating turntable, and do you want to, I assume we'll rip that out. And WCW was like, no. No, we'll no, we're doing it. a production of Les Miserables. No. We're going to need it. So yeah. when they first started filming WCW Saturday Night there, the ring spins because it's on that turntable the whole that ring? was used by the Mickey Mouse Club. The ring would spin. Yeah. <laughs> You can't really blame the referee for getting distracted and missing oh, out on the guy fast. cheating it was a real when he's slow, spinning around. Real slow rotation. The rotisserie yeah. ring. But there's a connect again, like in the nineties, I think a lot of famous people, a lot of productions have some tie to MGM because there a lot of production happened there, right? The Ernest movies, a couple of Ernest movies were filmed there. Um, you know, some some fairly well known television shows. I think Wheel of Fortune popped in. Um a lot of production happened, and a lot of very famous people rolled through. Um, there was a real a attempt to make this thing work. But, yeah, there's a lot of wrestling history in MGM. I don't even know where to circle back to at this point. I don't know where we're, we're Well, we were and going. And then they tore down the great movie, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, they ripped out. They yeah. kept the building, right? Yeah. Because that was necessary. Um, that's the same as, I think, you know, Epcot died for a long time, but I think a lot of people pinpoint the exact moment where Epcot was fully gone was when Illuminations, Reflections of Earth went. Like, that was the last piece of old Epcot, really, that held the yeah. whole thing together. And then I think Movie Ride was the thing for studios where that was the moment where it's like, okay, this is now, this is no longer what it was. It will now be something else. So I think, um, I think Epcot, as a learning park, died on uh, October 1st, 2019. And I think MGM as a park about, you know, the magic of the movies died on August 13th, 2017. Which is also when uh, Universe of Energy died. Yeah. yeah. That was a sad day. Yeah. Sad day in Disney. They took them both. They had to, they're like, we're closing both moving theater rides on the same day. Nothing will have this ride system anymore. <laughs> I mean, I remember the last time I went on the Universe of Energy. Sorry, I still call it Universe of Energy. What are you going to uh, call it? That's what it Ellen's. Was. That was a subtitle. Yeah. Um, I remember the foreboding, this ride is 45 minutes long. If you have to go to the bathroom, we have to shut down the whole ride to let you off. Whole warning. It was pretty yeah. scary. Right? They're like, oh, they really don't want you to, to be on this ride. 
if you have to go to the bathroom. But, uh, I I can understand um, why that ride went away. It was long. Um, it probably wasn't the most beloved, beloved ride by many people yeah. at Epcot. I know that people love the great movie ride. It was not – there was never a point when I was like, this ride needs to be destroyed. There Update. were times when I was like, this ride needs a major overhaul. And I'm sure they knew that and, when they built it, right? I mean, they mm-hmm. certainly knew that, you know, more film history is going to happen, right? So. Yeah. Oh, well. There went our great movie ride. And um, uh, Real quick, Mark Pyle asked in the in the Wigs chat, wonder if the handprints of legendary animators still are at Launch Barrier. No, they were moved. Um, they took them out. Um, they're supposedly preserved. I don't know if the archives took them or where they are, but they were they were specifically very carefully lifted out of the ground. So they have them. I think it was Mark Davis, uh, um, uh, Frank and Ollie, and uh, Ward Kimball, I think, were the four that were there who came to the grand opening. Wow. Yeah. That why, courtyard's still there. So if you walk into Launch Bay, because they changed from Animation Courtyard to Launch Bay, and it's in the middle but of I mean, the Launch Bay I mean, you could still area. acknowledge these yeah. people. Right? I think they were still there for a minute after Launch Bay opened, and then finally someone was like, hey— we should take those probably. So which story are you most looking forward to hearing at stage 89? Oh, my God. All of them. There's got to be something that really has tickled your fancy. Got Several you most things, excited. Right? So number one, like the Muppet Land stuff, right? Because I think we we have salivated at, what, three to five pieces of art we've ever seen for Great Muppet Movie Ride. So to finally hear, like, legitimately scene by scene maybe, you know, what that would have been and what the rest of the land might have looked like in more depth would Mm -hmm. be tremendous. I think Tower of Terror, I'm really excited to hear the lead up because I think there's a lot of – I feel like we talk about that lead up to producing Tower of Terror and it's so interesting and we spend two minutes on it, right? It's like, well, there were Mel Brooks things and then the Mel Brooks stuff fell through and then it was this and it was this and then it was a real hotel and then they turned into that. And it's like, well, I want to hear more about those things. I want to know how you got from point A to point D. Like, I need to know what were all these stops along the way? Like, how did this thing evolve into happening? And I think beyond that, like Tower... Like everyone I've spoken to that's come to the event talked about how it was a Herculean effort to pull that thing off. So there's got to be some really good stories about um, just creating that, just to how you got that ride system, a ride system that had never been built before. Yeah. Working with the licensing for CBS and you have to have Rod Serling's widow sign off on someone to, to do the voiceover for him. And um, like it's there's, there's going to be some good stuff there. And then obviously movie ride, right? Because I think... I think there's a lot about Movie Ride we don't know. I think they were that, – that early period of development for MGM has to be fascinating because they were fighting for rights to stuff they didn't yeah. own. And, and sometimes they won and sometimes they lost, right? Universal ended up with the rights to all of those famous characters like Marilyn Monroe and, and Charlie Chaplin and all of them. And then that's why Disney had to create Streetmosphere. They had to come up with something unique that, that fit the bill. Um, Ghostbusters. They wanted to put Ghostbusters in the great movie ride. There is art of Ghostbusters in the great movie ride. And then that fell through and they signed with Universal instead. So I want to know more about that. I'm sure there had to be other stuff they had envisioned. Or what would that Ghostbuster scene have looked like exactly? Like what would it have been? What was the original ending before you, you know, you at the end they had to build, um, you know, that theater at the end. But what happened, like tell us about at the last minute having to switch those Oz scenes over to something else very quickly. You are a couple months from the park opening, and suddenly two of the scenes of your ride have been taken away from you. Like, what what happened? Go into that a little bit. Yeah. You want me to? Yeah. Oh, so those that don't know, like, even though MGM's name was on the park, by the time they were finishing up, they started to have legal fights with them, where MGM suddenly wanted to get out of it. So it became... You know, oh, you can only use this much footage from this movie, and oh, you can only do this, and oh, we're not going to give you any more rights. Whatever you have built for Wizard of Oz is what you have. You can't have the twister, and you're not getting, and you're not getting the finale scene with the where the wizard reveals himself. You're not getting either of those things, and so they had to be like, Fantasia scene and movie montage, and right, you can't imagine 
great movie ride without that montage, but it wasn't even supposed to be there. Like, I want to hear about, like, rushing that out, like, the editing. That that had to be thrown together in record time to get that park open. There, There's a lot. I mean, but I'm really excited for every single presentation. What I'm not saying that because it's our event. I'm saying that because this park never gets a lot of love and respect. And certainly at no D23 event or anything of the sort have they ever spent a good amount of time on this park. When we're going to spend two days talking about this park. We like to do stupid little exercises <laughs> on this show. And I'm interested to know, uh, let's say you could replace three of the scenes of the great movie ride, maybe with updated stuff or movies that you felt better represented in a time period. What would you do? I've played this game before. Oh, boy. We've, I think I've done this on a news tonight, actually. Okay. I, I think they could have gone, they probably could have gone purely Disney with the movie ride, and that would have made everybody happy, right? I think you started with, you get rid of Footlight Parade, and you put the Mickey shorts, right? Because that's the company's beginnings. Was Steamboat Willie. We, weren't, we didn't do feature films. Yeah. We were relegated to the, the pre-show. Right, so you have Steamboat Willie and Plane Crazy, and that's the company's origins at, at the movies are these shorts that aired before feature films. Okay, right, and so then you have Placing in the Rain with uh, Twenty Thousand Leagues. That's like their first big, like that movie changed the industry. Right, another movie that changed the industry. You keep you have to keep Mary Poppins. Right, Mary Poppins has to stay. Um, I forget what I what I came up with for the other scenes, but I think Alien. If they didn't own Alien, which they ended up then owning. That could have easily became a Star Wars scene from yeah. New Hope, right? That look kind of looks like the hallways. You quickly redo that. Yeah. Um, I thought Tarzan, you just change it to Pirates of the Caribbean. You have a boat on either side of the ship, the yeah. battle scene with the boats. Um, you know, I, I think there was plenty of good material. I'm, to I'm concerned with the genesis of this idea, which is that it's all Disney films. And look, that would have been a good way for them to go in some respects. But also, I think if you're celebrating like the golden age of cinema and some of these things that there are holes that Disney has in their, um, in their repertoire. Fox deal um, filled a lot of those. Yeah. The Fox deal did. Um, you know, but a film like singing in the rain yeah. is this sort of, um, classic iconic American picture. I mean, people that have never seen it still know about that scene. Oh, absolutely. Um, I don't want those scenes to go away. Same but with I Casablanca, the, right? The, the realistic, if, if we want to approach this from a realistic point of view, Disney did not want to license that stuff anymore. Right. You know, and it needed to be modernized. And Disney as a studio has done a better job than any other movie studio in the world at keeping their franchises relevant, right? Like Mary yeah. Poppins has remained relevant. 20,000 Leagues for the most part still in the subconscious, right? People know what that is. I'll they know may have not P seen the movie. What about Blackbeard's ghost? We had wow. an assignment in the uh, previous I, I episode. I put a Blackbeard's ghost scene in, sure. Yeah. But Disney Disney Westerns, right? You could have had Zorro and Davy Crockett and updated that scene, right? Yeah. Yeah. I guess you could have. Yeah, you could you could do a lot with that. I, I think there are certain scenes that I can't imagine not being there. I think the yeah. Wizard of Oz scene has to be in there, right? Yeah, what do you do? I would like to see the um, – you could do an update of that scene if MGM would let you. Yeah. You know, the, that transition from black and white to color could be very dramatic these days with technology the way we have it. An actual good use for projection mapping, right? Yeah. Um, I – Cannot imagine not having the uh, the Ankh or the Anubis, uh, yeah. you know, scene with the jewel. It's a great like transition. It's yeah. a great uh, moment. Same with the. They did a good job, I think, having there's a gangster scene and a western scene yeah. that take place. You know, what where you can your your experience may vary a little bit. It gives the ride some repeatability. Um, I'm not saying they don't have other movies that that could have worked with. You could have done. You could have had Star Wars in there. You could have got taken over by, you know, some stormtroopers or yeah. something like that. Because, um, look, they're going to want to – they own Star Wars. They're going to want to cram it in there, right? And Star Wars was in movie, right? It was in the montage. Yeah, it was in the montage. I mean, yeah. but a million things have been in that montage. Yeah. Um, Indiana Jones had a scene, scene and in the was in the montage yeah. and had a show. Yeah. So, I mean, Yeah. The thing I remember the most is that um, I had never seen um, Showboat, mm. and so they're on the Cotton Blossom, this yeah. like 
ship. And when I grew up, the theme park Worlds of Fun that I went to had a gift shop was a big cotton, a full size cotton blossom. Yeah. So I was like, I recognize that. They're dancing at Worlds of Fun, which they weren't. Um, but yeah, that was a big one for me. I remember that. Um, and the montage scene, you know, easy to change, easy to update. You and know. they did several It's kind of like the end of uh, American Adventure, right? You just. Yeah. In an ideal world, Step I would away. have kept Casablanca and Singing in the Rain and those. But yeah. that that wasn't I, – I much would have – I would have much rather that the ride had lived on than um, be replaced in full. Look, and I understand that Footlight Parade represents a certain time and place in American cinematic history. Yeah. But it was not a film that people were running out to see or that would – if you mentioned yeah. – you know, it, there are movies that if you – if you take a, a basic film class at your local community college, that will be talked about. Um, probably not Footlight Parade. No. Probably not Footlight Parade. You're going to have some Battleship Potemkin, like really old stuff that's yeah. inevitably going to come up. Um, I think for sure, especially because they had so much trouble with the Footlight Parade scene. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, replace it with, if you want Steamboat Willie in there, congratulations, Tom. We're putting him in there. I just think it made sense, but... But again, that's that's me trying to save the ride from from annihilation, right? In in, in truth, right? I, I think if they were going to keep the ride um, and try to keep some of the MGM properties, the things that were easy to replace were Footlight Parade and Tarzan. Those yeah. were the two scenes that could have left, and no one would have cared, right? Yeah. And Tarzan could have been Pirates of the Caribbean, and people would have flocked to that ride. And people did, right? I my my favorite thing is when pe people come into the YouTube comments when I talk about movie ride and be like, ah, people aren't even going in there at the end, and blah blah blah. It's like, well, number one, it had fast pass, and number two, it's very often over a forty five minute wait, despite having a higher hourly capacity than your Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. So, oh, did it? Oh yeah, absolutely. The cars were giant. Yeah, they were. Yeah. And they were loading them like, I don't Packing know. Packing them in, yeah. I don't know how many at a time a 40, they could load. Before, close to like 45 minute wait was normal, right? Don't get me wrong, there were times today where it was shorter. But if you've noticed, that happened to Runaway Railway too. If you go in the, if you go in the evening, Runaway Railway is usually not that long. I, one thing that I will say is, I, I kind of, this is going to sound like I'm contradicting myself because I kind of trashed Universe of Energy earlier for this. But I liked it, having a ride that you might wait a while for it, but you're on it and you get to sit there and be comfortable in the air conditioning for a while. It was the right length, right? right? It was about the right length. Energy could, was too long. Yeah. Movie ride. Railway is too short. Yeah. You know, get in there for your 15 minutes or I don't know how long the ride was. I think it was almost 20. 20 minutes. Yeah. I, I think that was just about right. That was great. Yeah, you just get lost. Like Pirates of the Caribbean at Disney on. You just get lost in a world for a while. Yeah. It, it's great. We didn't talk about Gertie. You want to plug Gertie? I think they'll be left when this show comes out. Get your Gertie. They're, we're near the end of these. I mean, we're celebrating 35 years of Hollywood Studios. You got to get a Gertie. We've sold a lot of these. They're, we're near the end. They are nearly extinct, folks. So get yours now. Pre you would not want dinosaurs to go extinct. Yeah. Again. Don't don't look at this face. Don't don't disappoint. Don't this let her face. down. No. There you go. Get your Gertie again. We're we're almost out, and when they're gone, they're gone. We're not making more. So, we should make more. No, that makes them less special. <laughs> I know, but if people really like it, does that matter? Well, that's why we doubled the order. But we're think still about the kid who hasn't discovered our podcast yet. That's like I would snuggle that Gertie well, for the rest of my he better, life. He better hurry up and find the podcast. <laughs> Feel bad for these kids. I'm gonna buy extra ones to give to children. Get your Gertie plush. Is there anything else from any other MGM memories you have? I mean, I have just a lot of memories of uh, coming in, by the way, the film strip entrance, which yeah. to me was the front entrance. Lee and I got into a big argument, of, not an argument, but a discussion about it where she said, no, no, that was always just sort of an auxiliary entrance. I'm like, no, no, no. That the was World the Drive. main entrance right off of World Drive there. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, for years and years and years, they used that back entrance. I uh, love that back entrance. Yeah. No one ever went that way. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, it is the worst parking lot at um, any theme park I've ever been to. That's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. You can park. 
I mean, you can you can get parked really far away. And thank the, Bob Chapek the for that. They were supposed to build a parking garage before Galaxy's Edge. Yeah. And the money instead, they decided they're like, well, people won't park there if they have the Skyliner. Yeah. Because um, I think, like, you can look at Epcot's parking lot and it looks pretty vast, but it's actually pretty easy to get to any part of Epcot's yeah. parking lot, assuming you don't have, you know, mobility issues or something yeah. like that. Uh, yeah, you're going to be tired, but... I can get pretty much anywhere in the Epcot parking lot in five, ten minutes. Studio, sometimes you get to your row, you walk ten minutes to your row, and then you look down the road and you can't see the end of it. And you're going to have to go another you yeah. know, quarter mile down there or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, the one bad thing with MGM was because they felt the park would be small, they really wedged it in a spot where it's it's very much landlocked. And they've expanded as much as they can, but really, there's not much. No. There's not much more they can do. There's not a lot they could do. They could expand a little, but yeah. it's also weird. Be, I think it's a disorienting park in some ways, where some areas you would be in and be like, "Isn't this right where this thing is?" and and get turned around. Uh, part of it's because. Most of these parks, they feel like they go on kind of a north-south axis, right? So you walk into the Magic Kingdom, and you're going straight north to the castle. You walk into Epcot, and you're going south towards Spaceship Earth, and as you're leaving, you're heading north. This one, I think you're kind of going southwest-ish when you walk into Hollywood Studios, which feels counterintuitive to the rest of the property. I don't know. I like the layout of studios because I I call it the lollipop because you go up the street, and then it's just a big circle. Yeah. I, I mean, there is like the one except sunset comes. Yeah, sunset's back. like the tassel on the bottom of the wrapper. <laughs> it just veers off. It's a little weird, and when you're driving up World Drive and you see the Tower of Terror, you're like trying to orient yourself to like, where am I exactly? Cause well, because they feels, also set that on a yeah, so angle. it's at a weird angle. So the sun would hit. So it. there is some disorienting um, nature to yeah. the design of the park, but I think in general, I think they built a beautiful park, and uh, I. I mourn the parts of it that are that were great that are not there anymore, and I'm hopeful that in the future maybe it will become a better park somehow. I don't know how. I don't know. I think it's gone. I think it's like Epcot. You just have to accept it. Accept that it's gone. But we can relive that magic at Stage 89. I think it'll be very a very special nostalgia filled weekend for a lot of us. Stage 89.com. Yeah, we'll plug it again. Uh, Streaming tickets, only $10 right now. But if you can make it in person, I highly recommend. Obviously, if you're a Wigs member, there's a nice hefty discount on that ticket price. Yeah, I I know it's $300 standard ticketing. Um, Destination D last year was more than that, by the way. And we probably have more of the panels you actually want. Um, And all the proceeds that are left after we book travel for all these tremendous guests, all of that's going to give kids the world. So um, this is not to make a corporation richer. This event is to um, make memories that last a lifetime and also make a difference in the lives of some people less fortunate than you and I. So I think that's what's special about this event. I know it's expensive, but I don't think you can put a price on um, this this kind of experience. I think as a Disney fan, this is, you know, we're, we are scratching an itch that Disney refuses to scratch, essentially. Um, which I hope we get to do more of, provided this is a success. So I'd like to do more, maybe celebrate some individual attraction anniversaries, do more events in general. Um, So please support Stage 89. We appreciate it. Well, I've had a great time reminiscing about the genesis of uh, Disney MGM Studios. Mostly talking about wrestling. Talking about wrestling, (laughs) wherever the conversation leads. I think that's why people watch, because they never know what they're going to get. So I appreciate uh, your time and insight, Tom. We appreciate you you for watching. And we will see you next time on the WDW News Today podcast. The stuff dreams are made of. (laughs) See you real soon. See you at the movies. See you at the The movies. movies. I was doing movie ride.